Good morning or afternoon. I'm not quite sure which session this is going to fall into. Welcome again, if you've already been greeted to the 2021 North Carolina Beginning Teachers Summit session. My name is Stephanie Wallace. I am a Teaching Fellows graduate of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. I'm in my 21st year of teaching at East Forsyth High School in Connersville, North Carolina. And what brings me to this occasion is I am the 2020 Winston-Salem Forsyth County District Teacher of the Year. And so I am saddened that we are not able to be together in person, but I'm excited that I still have the opportunity to share a few tips and tricks with you that have made life for me in the classroom a whole lot easier. And even more important than that, gotten many of my students and parents to engage who otherwise may not have. So I'm going to share with you first um, the welcome slide that I'm sure you've seen with everyone's presentations for the template. I agree completely that it is our job to work together to do as much as we can to learn together. I think that we learn most often better from our colleagues um, and being able to observe each other and work together in dialogue. And I hope that there's something in this session that I say that is helpful for you in that process. So we are gonna be looking at concepts and principles around building engagement in your classroom, both with your students and with parents and stakeholders. Your students need to feel comfortable to take risks in your classroom and your parents need to feel like they are actively invited into your room to be a part of what's happening there. This is accomplished a lot more easily, I think, in elementary schools and even in some middle schools than it is for high school educators. There seems to be that disconnect that high school students don't need their parents to be involved or there's the belief that we need to give them complete ownership. And I think that a marriage of the two concepts is actually the best way to go. High school students do need ownership and they need that independence and they need that accountability. However, parents need to also be actively engaged and involved in what their students are doing in the classroom. And so I'm hoping to give you some tips and tricks for how to make that happen. So we are going to look specifically at some ways that you can differentiate um, some of your instructional and disciplinary strategies to engage your students and your parents, looking at strategies for academic engagement and contracts for disciplinary concerns, and then also looking at digital tools. And I focus a lot on that coming out of COVID style learning. That is something that we have all had to hone as a skill, I think. Um, and so I've added a lot of things to my toolbox and I'm hoping that some of these will be valuable for you as well. So let's start out by looking at the research. So take a second um, to read this slide. I don't believe in reading to adults. Okay. So as pointed out by Rebecca Grant here, um, my source is at the bottom, looking at the research out of the Harvard School of Education, it is staggering to me that 60% of our students are not graduating, less than 60% of our students. 2,000 high schools graduate less than 60%. Um, looking at that and the connection to the crime rate, looking at the amount of time that students stay engaged with their homework and those sorts of things when there is a parent involved, we can't deny the importance of that teacher family relationship. And looking at um, the instances where teachers had to redirect students, that class participation, those things go up when students feel like they are actively engaged and families feel like they're engaged in the classroom. Looking at a little bit more of the numbers, Students whose parents are given the opportunity to actively participate in your classroom, and this is not specific to elementary or middle school. They earn higher grades, they have better test scores, enroll in higher level programs. I don't know about where you folks are teaching, but we are really struggling here um, in my district to, to get students to want to engage in upper level courses. A lot of that is COVID. This is a very difficult way to learn. Hopefully next year we'll have bodies back in the classrooms and we'll be able to do a lot more of the traditional normal education. But a lot of students are not wanting to engage in higher level courses because they haven't found success in their basic courses. And I think a little bit more support, we saw the statistics on the last slide. If we can help them experience success as they're building up to the opportunity to begin taking those advanced level honors and AP courses, more students would engage. 
students who have parents who are actively engaged are promoted more often, they earn more credits, they come to school, which we all know is important, whether it's virtually or whether it's in person, the better social skills, I'm not sure what happened with my um, spacing there, it wasn't like that before I presented, they go on to post-secondary education, and these, um, these pieces of information come from the Center for Public Education um, from a 2017 study. So let's look at some of the tools that are in our tool chest. We have PowerSchool. And so PowerSchool, while it can be clunky and it can be glitchy and sometimes difficult to, to interact with, it can be a really valuable tool. For example, the new contact tab in PowerSchool. If you go to that tab um, through the backpack, all of their con student contact information is in one place now. It tells you who the primary contact is, who the student is living with, it lists emergency contacts, relationships, and one of the perks I think that we haven't had access to before, at least not in my district, is it also gives parent email addresses. And that is a wonderful, wonderful way for you to be able that you're making contact in multiple different ways. You can make that phone call and then follow up with the email. The quick lookup function in PowerSchool, if you're not familiar with it, allows you to look up a student's current attendance and grades in every class that the student is enrolled in and has finished in that academic year. I find this valuable with conversations. If I see a student starting to slip a little bit, I may go take a look at the quick look up and say, oh, okay, well, they're also slipping in their first block or they're also slipping in fourth block. Let me engage with that teacher and see if we can figure out what's going on with the student so that we know how to approach in a non-threatening way. The meeting attendance obviously is where you can go to see the attendance for all of their classes for the entire year. That will help you when you're looking for trends. Does the student typically seem to like to take Friday off or is, are we always party to our morning classes but on time for afternoon or vice versa? Another tool that we have through PowerSchool is the PowerSchool Gradebook. I adore the PowerSchool Gradebook, especially the amount of options that we have to communicate with our students and our families there. So the first thing is the comments function. When you, um, when you give an assignment in PowerSchool, you can go into the comments section and you can flag that assignment as submitted, as late, as exempt, as missing. And that gives parents the best opportunity to see where their, their student is in their work. And one thing to note here, make sure your parents know that there is a PowerSchool app where they can see all of this information in real time. Um, the second thing that you can do that I find particularly helpful, especially teaching an EOC course, is you can actually use PowerSchool now to assign your standard course of study objectives to each individual assignment that you enter in PowerSchool. This is a quick formative way for you to look back at a student and say, okay, this student seems to be missing a lot of the RL2 um, or RI5, whatever the case may be. They're missing a lot of the assignments that deal with that standard. Let me see what I can do to provide some additional resources. It's also a good way for your parents to see that you're avoiding what we call grade fog. You're not just putting random completion grades in there, oh, they showed up that day. I know and you know that we don't do that, but there are a lot of parents who um, question every little assignment that's in the grade book. And so providing them with the master's, um, mastery standards attached to an assignment is also a way to kind of head off some things that they may question about the purpose of an assignment. And the last part of that one is you can actually upload files. So if you have a handout that you gave out with that assignment, or like I said a minute ago, let me see where I can provide additional tools. I will use the handout function to actually attach a new assignment based solely around the skill that the student is struggling with, and then offer the student the opportunity to submit that in order to work towards that skills mastery. We all know that we're not just teaching content, it has to be about the skills behind the content. What can they do with that content? And so as we're driving towards mastery of content, mastery of skill, providing students with a safe place, the grade book is private, nobody else can see it but them and their parents, providing them with a safe place to be able to revisit something that they're struggling with is awesome, um, an awesome tool as well. I have a lot of students take advantage of that. I put Canvas on here as a note. I know more and more districts are moving to Canvas. Winston-Salem Precise moved to Canvas in the middle of COVID. It was a bit of a struggle because we didn't have a lot of formal training. Um, I'm fortunate that I have taught with North Carolina Virtual Public for many years and we use Canvas. The only difference is that content comes to me already built. And so learning how to build modules was a whole new beast for me. 
But as far as how Canvas helps us with these tools is Canvas, you can provide parents with what's called a pairing code. And that allows them to download the, the Canvas parent app and they can see all of their students' assignments, submissions, any comments that you've left, feedback that you've left. Canvas also has a grade book that does sync to PowerSchool. So you can leave additional comments there. Um, if you can get your school to do those rotocall things for you or the mass emails about that Canvas parent app, that helped us in my district to get a lot more parents on board and to actually download the app. Once you have um, your parents there, when you post an announcement, it goes to all your students, all your parents, all your observers. And so you can do screencasts, you can do videos, you can do um, just text announcements, but with pertinent information that you need in the hands of both your students and your parents. And that way you're pushing it out to them without having to rely on the student to deliver the information. Um, the Canvas Messenger function is also a valuable tool. So Canvas has its own little inbox that is not tied to any other email address or anything that a, that a student or parent may have. If they are enrolled in your course as a student or that observer, you can send them inbox messages um, and you can do send an individual message to each student or you can send it to the whole group. You can also choose, am I sending it just to my parents or am I sending it to my students as well? You have the autonomy to choose who your audience is. That's been a great tool for me for social emotional learning. I create Padlets and I'll send a Padlet link out to the students through a Canvas message. I've sent them to parents just as ways to check in and find out um, how they're doing, whether there's something they're struggling with that they don't want to tell everyone. If you're familiar with Padlet, you can, it's what we call freemium. They're free up to a certain number, but you can allow people to post anonymously. Or you could send an individual Padlet link to, to different audiences. But I've used that inbox function for social emotional connections quite a bit during COVID. Oh, I apologize. All right, another one of my favorite, favorite apps is called Google Voice. All you have to have is a Gmail account. If your district does not use Gmail, Winston-Salem does not, then you can create a Gmail account, um, whatever address you want. Mine is Mrs. Wallace's Eagles at gmail.com. When you have your Gmail account, you will download uh, well, I'm sorry, first, you'll create a fake phone number. And so the phone number is in no way related to your number. You can make it whatever you want to make it. And then you'll download the Google Voice app to your phone. Once you have it on your phone, your students and parents using that Google Voice number can text back and forth with you. They can also call you through that number as well. The thing that I like about it is it's not as glitchy as Remind, if you're familiar with the Remind app. I like it because you can send files through Remind, but sometimes if you're off the Wi-Fi, it gets really weird. And so Google Voice allows me to have real-time texting, so to speak, with my students and parents without them having my actual phone number. That means you can change your Google Voice phone number from one semester to the next if you want to, without any concern. Um, the other thing I like about it is everything is time stamped and date stamped. And so if you're texting back and forth with a student, there's not gonna be a lot of he said, she said because everything is time stamped and date stamped. And so you can use that to copy over into your communication log. And I'm gonna show you an example of my communication log in just a second. Again, you can change that number as often as you want to. And so you can change it from semester to semester or year to year. It's unlimited with that Google Voice um, account that you create through that Gmail. So the contact log is something that is central to engaging your students and parents in your classroom. And more importantly, to making sure that you're providing them a place that they feel safe because you can keep all of your information in one place. Some things to keep in mind about your contact log. The first thing is make sure you're in line with FERPA. Um, the Federal Education Rights and Protection Act for students gives us very, very strict guidelines about what we can and cannot include. And so for example, you can use the first initial and last name or last name or first name, last initial, but you shouldn't use both. You can create email groups. You can indicate your IEP and 504 information here. You can share your log with administrators and others as required. And the best thing is you can customize it. And so I'm going to attempt to show you my example without it kicking me completely out of my presentation, but we'll see what happens. So if you click on the link that I provided for you, you'll be prompted to make a copy. And when you make the copy, you will be able to then edit this and use it if you like it. And so I have three down here right now. Um, and the first one is where I keep my texters. So texters are a time-saving issue for me. 
and you can see I have things color coded. And so at the top, I have grade update, there's missing work. And so I always I have Joe, and then you just obviously change the name. I can use my canvas to find out how many assignments I've given and how many Joe has actually completed, which ones were on time and which ones were late. And I can also provide a submission update as if that work is still available to be turned in. I have one for failing, I have one for resubmission. I have a praise update when I can send out to parents and celebrate their students. A lot of times, um, I know as a high school parent, I have a freshman and a senior. I don't get a lot of communication unless it's that somebody did something they weren't supposed to or somebody's missing work. And so I make it a concerted effort to, again, create that engaging environment where my students feel like they can take risks by praising them of every opportunity that I get. And then I also have my tardy ones down here. So to take a look at what it might look like for communication with a student, this is an example of what, and I would, where this is course one, I would label these each one of my blocks. And so I've blacked out the student's names over here. This is from my actual contact log. And so I have the date, I have the number that I contacted them in. I have, and that's a fake number. I have um, the outcome, I had to leave a message. Um, administration, I contacted them when I was unsuccessful, they were gonna attempt to contact. The CARES referral is something that we have um, in our county during COVID, and that's where the teachers tried, administrations tried, no one's been able to get in touch. And so we refer them to CARES and they'll actually work with the social worker guidance counselor, whoever the appropriate person is, to go out to the house and try to make that contact. And then you can see over here, I added additional information. And so you can use your contact log to kind of have everything all in one place. The one thing I really like about it being in um, in Google Drive is that it goes anywhere with you. And so you don't have to worry about it if you don't have um, your computer with you. If you have the Drive app on your phone, you can pull it up there. Um, the other thing that I really like about keeping a detailed contact log is even when you are praising students, a lot of times if you notice a student has some sort of social emotional issue, you can go back to where you provided praise and see, did I, did I praise every student evenly? Were students in a conversation and one student mentioned, oh, Ms. Wallace sent my parents this, and you realize you didn't do it for everybody. So it's an accountability piece for me as well to make sure that I'm supporting all of my students, the ones who are doing what they're supposed to, and the ones who may not be quite there yet to the best of my ability and that I'm doing it equitably. Oh, good, it went back to the um, presentation for me. So. I use Google Forms, and if you, I've given you again the option to here file make a copy. The first one is my parent guardian form, and I always make sure I address things as parent or guardian, because we all know that not all of our students are living with their parents. Some of them are living with aunts, uncles, grandparents, some of them are in foster situations, and I don't want those people to feel like because they're not the parent per se that I'm not including them. So I always use parents and guardians or families. The second one is my student. These will allow you to make a copy of the Google um, forms that I use to gather information about my students. So the parent one, it asks me, we'll try this again and see if, it, if it's gonna work and not kill my presentation. So if you go into the parent one, it's spinning, it's trying. This one is gonna show you, you can have them put their name. That's a key one for me because I also have a lot of students who are living with individuals that don't have the same last name. And so it's frustrating for me to get a phone message or an email from a parent with a last name that I don't have matching up to a student. And so this allows me to make sure that doesn't happen. Their email address, phone number. And then I simply say, tell me anything about your student that will help me foster his or her success in my classroom. You would be surprised how many parents I've had who have reached out to me and said that they've never been given the opportunity to tell a teacher up front before things got started what they know would help their student be successful. And I have been completely impressed with the amount of information that I get from using this form. I have parents tell me everything from don't just don't call them out in class, they are easily embarrassed, to they really flourish if they can get up and move around or if you can use music. And so that, that that's kind of open-ended allows parents to really feel like they can can trust you. You will have one or two parents who will leave it blank and that's okay. It takes a while to build that rapport. But once um, 
I usually send it out again, like towards the end of the first quarter, start of second quarter. I'll just change the language a little bit, looking at how we've landed at the end of first quarter. What can I do to help your student moving forward or to continue to support your student if the student's doing really well? Um, the student form, ask them their preferences. Do you like group work? Do you prefer individual work? Do you like quiet? Do you like music? What is it that you need me to know about um, what helps you learn in the classroom? Are there games you like? Are there certain strategies you've had teachers use that worked really well for you? So same sort of thing for the parent and guardian, only it's giving the student a chance to really be vested in my lesson planning process. And I make sure that, you know, I tell them before I, I give them the form, I can't make everybody happy all the time. Yes, we're gonna have to do group work sometimes. Yes, we're gonna have to test in silence sometimes. But I do use that information to inform my lesson planning to try to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to do something that they really enjoy and that they feel like they can be successful with. So how to manage your communication. And I, okay, I just wanted to double check because it felt like it skipped a couple slides on me there. I apologize. Managing communication is a piece that I have people ask me about all the time. So how do I keep up with making sure I'm making these contacts? My suggestion is to make sure that you divide them into manageable groups. These are four different ways that I have um, found on my faculty, serving my own faculty about what they're doing. So the first one, I have one colleague that does it alphabetically. And so she chunks her alphabet depending on each roster. She may contact A through E on Monday, F through whatever on Tuesday. She chunks her roster into alphabet groups so that she's making a few contacts every day. And she said that she does this on a bi-weekly basis. And so every student home is getting a touch, as she calls it, every other week. The second one, I have a, um, a colleague that does it bi-weekly based off grade. So on Monday, she's calling anybody with a D or an F, and that's intentional. She said she never wants to call a parent or a student um, on a Friday with the news that there's a D or an F, because that ruins your entire weekend. And so she makes those hard phone calls on Monday and is ready to put into place what days and times that week she's available for additional assistance if the student wants to work to raise that grade or if the parent wants to have a more thorough in-depth conference rather than just the phone call. On Tuesday, she calls her C's, Wednesday, her B's, and then Friday's her A. Her rationale for skipping Thursday, I don't know, but that works for her. The third option, I have a colleague that does it by class period. On Monday, she calls her first period. On Tuesday, she calls her second period. That one would be a little bit more stressful for me because my school is on a hybrid schedule. So my first period is actually A day, B day, and my second period is block. And so that one would be a little bit more stressful for me because it wouldn't evenly distribute that communication. And then the last one is using Sign Up Genius to schedule appointments. We know as educators, a lot of time, our calendars fill up really fast between trying to be moms or dads or, you know, whatever our roles are outside of our classroom to also having the lesson planning time, doing your professional learning teams, doing your staff development, if you're on school improvement team, all of those things. And for you guys as beginning teachers, I know in Winston-Salem, they have, um, I think it's called SOAR or STAY. I don't remember what the, the current acronym is but they have additional development to do our BTs. And so using Sign Up Genius allows you to kind of monitor your own schedule because you can make those appointment slots available at weird times. Like you could do a 9.15 to a 9.30 and then maybe take a break until 10 and then do them back to back 10 to 11. That gives you kind of the autonomy to be able to decide how you want to, to schedule those parents, how closely together and how long you want them to last. And so Sign Up Genius, and it's free too, which is also helpful. Sign up genius for appointments is another good way to make sure you're managing your parent contact. So I hope that something that I've had today has been valuable for you. I know that it's a lot of information in a short amount of time. One good thing about having these recorded is that you can go back and rewind and fast forward as much as you want to. I do hope that the sources that I've linked in here are helpful for you. You do have my contact information here. That is my school system email address. And then you've got my phone number. And generally, four to six works for me. Um, my school day ends at 340, so it would have to be after that. But feel free to shoot me an email anytime, and I'll be happy to respond. I hope that all of you have a wonderful conference. I hope you are able to add lots and lots of things to your toolbox. And most importantly, let me end by thanking you. 
thanking you for choosing teaching. Thank you for choosing education as a profession in a really, really difficult time. And I hope that you know you have lots of us veteran folks who are cheering for you and excited to see you come into the classroom. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference and thank you so much for all of your attention.